begin with prayer. So often, Lord, we only remember to turn to you in time of need. We only remember to offer prayers when we are sad or feeling lost and alone. And yes, that is certainly time to call upon you. But Lord, may we also remember to give you thanks during the good times. May we remember to thank you when everything in life is going well. And finally, may we remember to look around us and come to the realization that your blessings are numerous. You give us far more than we need or deserve. And so it is with humble and grateful hearts that we offer up our prayer of thanks for blessings received. In Jesus' name, amen. So page, well, actually, let me, um, I've got myself a post-it note here, and even though I have a post-it note, I generally forget by the end of, the, end of class, so I'll say at the beginning and try to remember it at the end, too. Next week um, will be 7 o'clock instead of 6.30, because next, we are having Bible study next week. Um, so we will not be finished with this. We'll finish this up next week. Um, we are meeting next week, but it will be at 7 o'clock because I begin confirmation next week. So 7 p.m. So our regular. And choir starts, correct. 6.15 next week. So page 15 is where we find ourselves on our study guide that we've been following. And um, we'll walk through the questions there. And if we happen to be done a little early, um, we can end a little early. So question one says, the author writes, don't be deceived. God takes ignoring the underprivileged as seriously as actively oppressing them. How does that make you feel? Gemma. All right. And so, in your answer, you, you speak about what we, what we ought um, to be doing and what the Lord encourages us to be doing, um, and, and rightfully so. Um, I'll come back also to the, the question, because it's meant to be a bit of a self-reflective one. Um, how does it make you feel when you consider the comment the author made, God takes ignoring the underprivileged as seriously as actively oppressing them. You answered it just fine, Gemma. Um, Rachel. Um, yeah, guilty. Uh, you, you, think about, you think about those times of where um, we, we are perhaps in a position to be able to assist or to help somebody um, who, has, who has less or who is not as fortunate or blessed as, as we are in material or physical things. And we convince ourselves that we don't know how that person would use what we might give to them, and so we, we might not assist them, but we're not oppressing them, and so we, we tell ourselves, um, no problem. And I'm not saying that every situation that we are in is going to present its opportunity for us to do something. Um, but there have been many an opportunity that we have probably found that we have decided, um, no, not now. I don't want to take the time, or um, I'm too busy. 
and the Lord speaks in, in that regard as well. Um, not just the act of oppression, but the ignoring the needs of others. Um, James puts it well, right, in, in his, his beautiful little book towards the end of the Bible, um, that if somebody sees somebody in need and says, well, go, be well fed, and, you know, have well everything you need, but we do nothing to help them, um, well, what kind of love is, is that? Rudy. Rudy. Yeah, a good phrase to pick out of there. Um, we are the hands and the voice of God he, he wants to bless. What a, what a privilege, what an honor that he even stoops to use us in such a fashion, in such a way. Um, yes, Gemma, comment? Um, it's a good question. Our Lord says to us in Scripture that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And when we think about the definition of neighbor, um, rightfully and oftentimes the definition is thrown out as that that's everybody. And that's not wrong. But a better way for us to, to define that to make it more concrete is by saying everybody who we are in a position to be able to help and assist. Um, so technically, the person in Zimbabwe is my neighbor. I'm not really in a position, more, more than likely, I might be at some point, but I'm not really in a position to be able to to help that person at this present time. Um, I don't know them, I don't know what need they have. Um, but yes, um, individuals who are going through some sort of catastrophe that I've never met, that I don't know if I can, can be of assistance, um, I want to do that. And, and the beautiful thing is, is that um, both in the secular world, but also in um, our fellowship of believers, there's ways that we are able to do that. Um, you know, you think about something like a Red Cross, um, but also you think about um, the Christian Aid and Relief Fund and, and um, committee that our, our synod has. So, you know, after Hurricane was Idalia, um, Gets, go, gets done going through the panhandle and the parts of Florida that it will, a, a, a group of people from the Wells Christian Aid and Relief will go down there. They'll assess the damages, and um, congregations down there will apply for some aid. And Christian Aid and Relief has this big fund of money, um, and they will then give some of that money to help rebuild those churches, rebuild those things, help... Um, member family houses, and then also reach out into the community at large. And when we, um, whether it be individually, we give a gift to such a thing, or when we corporately as a congregation, um, which we do every um, Sunday after Thanksgiving, we have a door offering for the Christian Aid and Relief, is we are assisting those neighbors in that regard as well. Did I answer your follow-up question too? Or did you forget it? Stuff. 
Yeah, and, and, my, and my question was directed in the author's, the author's um, thoughts in the chapter were directed um, kind of specifically to those who are underprivileged, um, the individuals who we can tell, um, or maybe they've made it known that they have some need um, or, or have a great need as well. Um, question two. On page 148, 149, the author writes, one simple act of kindness does not level a mountain of rebellious rubble. What vitally important biblical truth does the author make with that statement? Evan. And so especially the first thing that you, you made comment of there, um, it is a wonderful way of stating the truth that um, there is no way that our actions and the works that we do could ever save us. Because nothing that we do is going to erase or make up for the things that we have done wrong. Um, you know, we could use any type of illustration that we might like to in, in a situation like that. But, you know, if somebody has committed a, a terrible crime and they have, gone to, they have gone to jail as a result of it, and after 10 to 15 years in jail they get out, just because they did the time does not take away the fact that they committed the crime. Um, and, you know, that, that's true when it comes to the fact of, you know, um, anything that we do, it doesn't have to be a heinous, terrible crime. Um, you know, anything that, that we've done, if we've hurt somebody with words, the Lord absolutely wants us to apologize. When we speak to another Christian, Lord willing, that Christian will, will respond with words of, I forgive you. But just because we apologize like the Lord wants us to, and just because the other person forgave us doesn't mean we didn't ever do it. We still did it. Um, and no amount of the good that we do will ever erase the fact that we did the wrong. The only thing that erases um, the wrong we've done is the blood of Jesus Christ. And the, the key of what I said and what you just said there as well is the word we. You, Gemma, cannot erase them. Um, and that's the point of the statement that was made by the author and the reason for my question. Um, it, it, well, no, it, and, and what, I, what I'm trying to point to is the point that I'm making, the point the author is making, is that if at any point we think anything we have done has erased our sin, we are in a world of hurt. Question three. Why go to all the trouble to tell us about Rahab? Rudy. No matter what they've done, no matter who they are in the eyes of the world, right? Um, you know, here he is showing that love to a nobody. Um, if your hand doesn't hurt too much, Annette. Um, And we do 
not sin like they had been sin, because that was a fake bad sin. And, and yet, you know, she is forgiven, she is in the line of Christ, and she is the same sinner that we are. And it, it kind of, I don't know, maybe makes us realize that. And I think um, you, you and Rudy um, had the same thoughts that I did as I, as I read this section and, and why did the author include so much about Rahab. Um, it is that, that truth that look at how God loves everyone, wants all to be saved. And the author, I thought, had a nice phraseology with it as well. He said, um, Israel shown in this. Um, it seems to me it should be shined, but maybe shown is the proper way of saying it. Um, but, you know, they left a marvelous example. And in the Lord recording that for us, he, in essence, is leaving this wonderful example for us to follow as well, as you, you really touched on with what you had to say there, um, Annette. Yep. Yep. Yeah, um, it is something, and it's 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 amazing when you when you look at that whole entire um, lesson and just how God's actions in Egypt had made its way all the way to the to the Promised Land, and the fact that this was taking place what. Um, 40 years afterwards, um, and that that message that had been carried would, would work and that the family would listen then to Rahab too. Um, whether, they had, whether they had faith at that moment or not, um, not for us to determine, not for us to need to know, but um, it's interesting that obviously there was enough that they knew that said, um, boy, if Rahab's going to say this to me and this is the way it is, let's listen to her and, and get into her house. Yeah. And, and in both those situations, it, it kind of emphasizes what, what is sometimes the... Um, I don't want to say excuse, because I don't, it's not necessarily excuse, but what is sometimes the, the mindset of somebody, um, of a Christian is, well, I will share my faith when I know, my fa I know the word better. I'll share my faith when I feel like I'll be able to give a better answer. Um, and both those examples um, show very clearly this is something we get to do and we have a, an ability to do right away. Yeah. Question four. When it comes to loving others, people, the world, or even we might consider a nobody, what are some important things to keep in mind about them to help us remember they are a somebody? You don't have to list them all. I, saw, I, I kind of saw three in those pages. Um, but don't let that hesitate, keep you from answering, because you don't have to say three of them. Dave. Yeah, I think that's huge, hugely um, important and a, and a great point. Is um, One of the things we want to remember is this is a soul. Um, when we can see everybody as a soul, and not see them as maybe the sin that characterizes them, or see them on the basis of what they once did to us, or the way that they once acted, um, but this is a soul. Um, hugely, hugely important. Anybody see anything else there? Joan. Somebody else will take care of that. 
So keep in mind as we, as we are trying to help out other individuals is, is ultimately they're, they are worthy of our time. Maybe that's a good way to, to say, right? They're worthy of our time. Yeah, we, isn't it interesting? We, we, are, we are so busy, and, and yet um, I, I thought the author did a, a really neat job, too, of saying we convince ourselves we are so busy, even though sometimes, and, and that we convince ourselves that we are connected to people, even though sometimes we aren't. Um, really connected. It's just that through social media we think it, and, and sometimes that very same social media is what makes us so busy, or feel so busy. So they're worth our time. Yeah, that's a good one. Gemma. Back to question four, Rudy. Yeah, and, and we, could, we could kind of say, couldn't we, um, from God's point of view, there is no such thing as a nobody. Um, so we, see, we want to see everyone as a soul. We want to recognize that there is no such thing as a nobody. We want to recognize that they are worth, of, worth our time. Anybody see anything else there? Brad. Uh, uh, we need them uh, to be able to help us to grow, uh, just like God used the lesson of Rahab for our benefit. We need them just as much as they need us. Another good point. Um, we need them just as much as they need us. I've often, I've often said, and I think that a lot, of, a lot of you would probably agree, that one of the ways that we find our faith um, oftentimes growing and being strengthened the most is when we are sharing it with others. Because we, in a way, we have to wrestle with it. Wrestle with the questions that somebody has. Wrestle with the, the questions that they have for us um, and, and what we want to, to say. It becomes real. Did anybody else see anything else in that section of things we want to keep in mind about others to help us remember they are somebody? Joan? <laughs> you know, and you, you've opened your home to, to this family that's homeless, and, and they're like, yeah, yeah, no, I don't really like this. You know, it just, you know, and it's probably bad, Penny, if it's in a way to say, you know, really? This is who we are, but then to say, you know what? You know, she's entitled not to like a person as much as I am. So, um, but I just want to. 
one of my biggest roadblocks is it's like I, I don't want to put anyone else in an awkward position like that. I don't want to be in that position myself. Yeah. So that, that holds me back from perhaps reaching out as much as I could. Sure. So another good point. I'm letting go of our fear. One other thing that I saw in there and I, was the fact that I'm remembering that we are not superior to them. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that um, in, our, in our day and age, it's really easy to be, to be characterized as and to be accused of being um, discriminatory. And, of course, we want to do all that we can to make sure that we are not. But if we are honest, there is a, an, a part of, of a discriminatory um, mindset that resides in all of us because of other people who aren't like us. Um, and, and so they, they all kind of go hand in hand with, with each other, these, these thoughts, but just different things to keep in mind um, to help us always recognize that everybody is a somebody. Um, somebody that Christ died for, somebody that I want to, to witness to, somebody that I want to um, offer help to and serve in whatever way that I can. Um, what difference does it make to see everyone as a soul and no ordinary person? Evan. Nice answer. <laughs> he'll, 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 he can share it with you afterwards. Okay. Um, yeah, it makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? it makes all the difference. In the, Mark. This is true. Um, keep it in mind the spiritual, not just the earthly. Um, that's what, you know. That's one of the things um, that we do now um, at our at our congregational meetings because of because of a suggestion of what a, what a, one of our members um, that when we go through the the membership changes, um, rather than just looking at those membership changes as you know this is business and people have have come, have, have gone to their eternal glory, have been released, is, is also at the end of that to offer up a prayer, to remember that these are souls. Um, these are people that the Lord has brought into our midst that we pray that they'd be a blessing to us as we are a blessing to them. Um, people who have finished their race of faith here on this earth, um, to remember that this isn't just business. We're talking about, about people. Question five, who are the overlooked and ignored in our community? Annette. Not that you are the only one that has to answer this, but let's take, um, since, you, since you suggested, and, and rightfully so, um, those who might be overlooked or ignored in our community, the second part of that question right away is how, how can we help them? How can we love them? Annette? Joan? I'm at the library a lot, and there are a couple of homeless people who spend their, their days pretty much there. And I just, I greet them. I learned their names. I, I greet them. Um, the one young gentleman, I mean, if I carry things, he'll offer to help me carry things. Um, I think just treat them the same way I would any other person who, who is there. Um, it is one way to do that. It's like, for a few minutes or so. 
Yeah, and, and who knows, um, such, such actions can open up a line of, of communication or uh, an avenue for an individual to share what, what really is, is, is a need on, on their part too because they say, uh, this person has demonstrated a, a, an actual concern for me or that, like you said, they see me. Yeah. Rudy. Rachel. So perhaps the, the children being the overlooked and ignored. Um, because it's always great for us as a congregation and a, and a group of believers together to be able to have conversations like this, um, I'm going to jump off of the word that you used, Rudy. Um, diversify our ministry, and you gave some examples of it. Are there other ways? that we could diversify our ministry to show love in this capacity in these ways. Evan. So diversifying our ministry in what we and when we provide opportunities for worship and spiritual growth. Rudy, I see a hand going up. Brad. Um, maybe it's a space thinking of like Rachel's observation. Um, maybe it's a space for development, you know, an after school uh, program or something like that. Where they have a place that they could go and they have um, caring individuals that can help them and they can also uh, share. 
there isn't a wrong answer, and, and I, I pause just because um, give opportunities for the wheels to to turn and for for thoughts to flow. Carolyn. We are we are still doing that, and um, it it is back on the the youth group um, radar to do it again this year, and and to get that so that there's those bags continuously available, and to put it back out into the minds and the in the front of the the minds of our people to take that and and have them available. So yes. So, so a general, generally, kind of the same concept as the bag, just maybe a little bit smaller scale. Yeah, just yeah. I think you used, did you use a backpack. It was kind of those string backpacks. Um, somebody had a bunch of them at home, and they brought them in. And that was one thing that, um, in in looking, I think online, they said that that those who who may be in those positions really can appreciate and, and make use of that because then all of a sudden it becomes a backpack that they make use of and carry things around in too. Um, and you know there were some things on that list that I would never have thought of, but you know things as simple as toilet paper and Kleenexes and um, things like that um, that we take for granted. Yeah. In many respects, we, we came back to, to question five, the first part of it, um, of who are the overlooked and ignored in our community. Was there, were there any others that you, you thought of, though, that um, we didn't touch on in that conversation? Annette. Yeah, and I think you are right that it is, it is a case of it fits under five and six um, in the sense of in our community as well as within our church. Um, one of the things, and, and, and I, was, I was tickled in a, in a really, really neat way when, when I brought up to, I always try with the youth group to let them come up with ideas of what they'd like to do as far as service projects go. And all on their own, and this was last year, um, they came up, well, what about if we went out and like visited and read to or played games with our shut-ins? I said, awesome. Um, the challenge was um, the logistics of it and, and the time for me to have, to be able to, to get all the logistics of that um, so it never happened last year, but they, they said again this year, let's, let's try to do that. And, and I have um, elicited, is that the right word, solicited? That always sounds bad. But um, the help of, of some of our parents to try and um, get those logistics in place because it's a matter of, you know, probably the, the youth are going to feel more comfortable in two of them going to one because sometimes... Um, that one might not carry on a lot of conversation, and and it's 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 a learned art to carry on a one-sided conversation, um, and and if there's two of them, a lot more comfort, and then just making sure that the nursing homes are okay with it, and and when and 
can they come in and and then transportation in that regard as well so um, parents are helping with that but I know I made comment to one of our shut-ins about that and the very first thing that they said that'd be really neat um, for them to come in and and see the people in here and I, you know, my first thought was, well, I was thinking just our members to begin with, because the logistics then get even wider. But how true that is, is even the people within our community that are not members, um, there's a lot of them that don't have a whole lot of people coming to visit them. Um, I don't know if you remember um, Bruce from RJ's that came for a short while, um, Goose. Um, and you know, John is always the one that keeps me up to date when things change at, at the home. And he, he told me when, when Bruce went into the hospital, um, he wasn't sure why, he wasn't sure where he was. I, I called the hospital, couldn't find him. And John didn't know where he was because, you know, he's not allowed to have that information. And all of a sudden I go over and visit Sherry Bue and she's not in her room and I we're walking around the facility, and who should I run into? Bruce. Um, but I, I don't think there's a whole lot of people that come and visit him. Um, and, you know, he was, he was excited. He remembered me. He was excited to see me. Um, so, yeah, I think that's an excellent one as well. And, you know, maybe, maybe there's a, a way within our, within our own congregation. Um, I, this is just something that popped into my head now, so don't run with it. But, you know, you adopt a shut-in. You know, somebody adopts a shut-in. Um, and you adopt them for a month. And you visit a couple, two, three times in a month. Um, and we have the lots of helping hands to kind of bring some of that stuff out, too. Um, but, you know, sometimes if an individual isn't requesting this, it doesn't get onto the lots of helping hands, sometimes we almost need to say, this needs to be done um, in those ways as well. Joan, I saw your hand. So, you know, maybe, you know, as a group project, okay, the, the home is having this meal at this night, you know, we, we have a group that would be willing to come in and sit with them so they're not alone. And I mean, that just <laughs> broke my heart to hear that. Like, I'll go sit with them and have a meal with them. I mean, it's, it's such a powerful thing, especially, you know, when they, they have their community mm -hmm. there. Um, my, my grandmother really appreciated the community she built Yeah. That um, thank you for that. I think that's another good one. And that might be even a good way to, to start to at least get your foot in the door and have, and maybe that would be, because of my fear of giving, it would be less anxiety for the kids as well. You know, it's like we're doing this all as a group. You know, we'll be at different tables and that, but logistically that would be an easier yeah. way to go in. Yeah, that, no, that's, a, that's an excellent idea. Thank you. Rudy. I say, I'm, I'm so excited that you're there. I think that the young people are overlooked a lot of times, and, and they have a great deal of value. Spending most of my ministry in high school level. But, I mean, we would send out kids, and they were just anxious to do it, to do Bible, uh, vacation Bible study in the churches around the country. Do mission work in, in, in South America. I mean, I think sometimes we overlook the value of our young people, and I'm happy to hear that. And I know that Scott's movement wasn't the only high school, the offering high school. Yeah. Um, with question six, it, were there any other ones? Um, 
in the overlooked and ignored in our congregation that we, we want to keep in mind and talk about. Rachel. Rachel. Yeah, um, I, I heard a, an, an illustration, um, secular illustration, the other day, but um, a worthwhile illustration because um, God has been saying it all along. I don't know if this is true and if it really ever happened, but the illustration went like this. Um, a professor in school handed b a balloon out to all of his students, and he said, blow it up, um, and then write your name on it. And he had all those students um, from, all, from his classroom throw them all out in the hall. He said, okay, I want, I'm going to give you five minutes. Go find your balloon. And after five minutes was up, not everybody had found their balloon. So he said, I'll throw all your balloons out in the hall again. Um, he said, I'm going to give you five minutes. And you pick a balloon, and whatever balloon you have, give it to the person whose name is on it. And within two or three minutes... They all had their balloon. Um, the point of the illustration that I'd heard was, well, if you're constantly looking only to yourself, um, you're always going to feel unfulfilled and never really accomplish those things. But when you are looking to serve others, um, then they'll say, and God's been talking about serving others um, since sin entered the world. Um, in fact, we could say it was there before because it would have been done perfectly um, with Adam and Eve. But yeah, um, what way can I serve? Um, whether it be this group, this age, um, you think somebody uh, single, and we, I know we've talked about it in a previous Bible study. Um, you know, we often talk and think about all the people within our family that we get together um, at, at holidays. But what about the single individual in our congregation who doesn't have any family around? Um, you know, what can we do to incorporate them into our family? Um, yeah, and you talk about the, the one that's widowed, or the widower, or the one who has recently lost um, a, a, lo a spouse. Um, I oftentimes will, will try to get out um, about a month to a month and a half to visit the individual who lost a spouse. And I come out there, and they oftentimes will ask, well, you know, or, or be a little surprised that I'm, I'm calling up, can I come out? I said, well, one of the reasons that I do it is because a whole lot of people spent time with you the first two, three weeks afterwards. But after those three weeks, that kind of starts to dwindle away. So I just want to come out and see how you're doing. Um, and so you, you think about, you think about those, those things um, as we look to and ways to serve others. Um, in all reality, the beautiful thing is that the Lord um, brings us this beautiful contentment and a fulfillment in our lives as we are continuing to serve others rather than striving to serve ourselves. We never really feel all the way contented or fulfilled when we are just simply living for me. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, let's see if we can't get question um, seven and eight done, but uh, at the same time, um, those are also two questions that are worth spending time on if there's more thoughts, um, especially since our last um, section that we will read and go through next week um, is, has fewer questions, so if we need to. See nothing else. Question seven. What does the author mean when he says, when a building, a small group, or a Christian organization becomes our safe place, we have created an idol that will warp our perspective and keep us from God's purposes for our lives?
Go ahead, Evan. I, I like I like your um, illustration and your terminology there. Not not a storm shelter, um, base of operation. Um, you know what what's the whole idea of a storm shelter? The whole idea of the storm shelter is to keep everything bad out. Um, all the thing I don't want to deal with, all the and, and in the the context of this book, all the people I don't want to deal with. Um, and if that's what we we turn our church into, we miss the whole point. Um, is it a blessing that our church oftentimes is a safer place? Absolutely. But the goal isn't making it that safe place. It's that safe place because the word of God is there that we get to hear, um, that, that feeds us, that, that builds us up. But it's not there to shut out the world and the people that we don't want to deal with. Um, and, you know, that's, that's such a valuable thing I, I was I was just talking talking with Rachel and saying that it's an interesting thing that I didn't plan it specifically this way, but the the five things and especially um, the the thoughts of transgenderism and homosexuality that we'll talk about um, when we talk about a biblical response to things in in the Bible class that will follow immediately after this for those five weeks. It, it flows so very nicely um, on the heels of this book. Because, you know, what is it? Um, we do not want to be a church that says, well, we don't want anybody like that here. We actually want to be a church that says we want all sorts of people like that here um, because we want to be able to reach them with the gospel. Uh, and there's a difference between welcoming them to hear the gospel and condoning the sin. And you stop and you think about, you think about those, those things that we've talked about here before, too. Um, how do we see them? Do we see that person as a transgender, or do we see that person as a soul? Do we see that person as a homosexual or as a soul? And, and do I see myself as superior to them because I don't do that, and they do, as if this is the, the unforgivable sin? Um, and all those things will play into part when we, when we go through some of those things um, in the next couple of weeks as well. Rudy. I, I just want to call your attention to a comment that he makes near the bottom of page 160. The problem with trying to shut out evil is that we take our own evil with us into the fortress. Yeah. An excellent, an excellent um, statement. Um, he probably uses more colorful language than, than I, I have, but I've often said to, to people, I said, um, if you go into a room that has absolutely nothing in it, please understand you're still going to constantly sin because you're taking your sinful nature with you. Um, closely, um, I don't know if it was that, that same that same section, but, but very close to the thought, is a natural follow-up um, on page 161. He quotes one preacher who said, the way to avoid sin is not to avoid sinners, but to stick close to Jesus. And that is a beautiful statement, too. Um, nice way of, of sta stating, stating the biblical truth. Um, question eight. On page 162, the author writes, to be honest, there are people who just don't seem like they are worth our time as we touch their lives with the love and message of Jesus. We might think that they are too far gone, but no one is beyond the reach of God's cleansing love. How do these words convict you? How do they compel you? We should all know what compel means now. This is the good compel too. Ha, <laughs> ha,
<laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. Evan. Um, do you want me to answer convict and compel or just convict? You could do both. Okay. Um, my response like, to the convict, how does it convict to you is that we may not want to put the effort to save them with the word for it. That is either a time inconvenience. It, we would certainly hope it's not a spite, in spite where we want them to not hear the word. Yeah, and, and, and I like, like the fact that you shared a specific way in which it convicts, is, um, convicts, convicts us, convicts me, for the times that I haven't been willing to put the effort in. Where I haven't, you have to understand, sometimes I, I just use myself. Um, I, I, fall, I fall prey into those things um, as well, but it doesn't mean that, that I... I'm thinking of yesterday what I failed to do, but um, convicts me for the times I'm not willing to put the effort in, is what I said. Rudy. I would say this is for compel. Uh, and I've got to use him. He just has a bunch of good stuff in this book. Allow me to read it. Sure. Showing compassion and touching the lives of others, especially the world's nobodies, takes a lot of time, hard work, and dedication. It's messy. There are setbacks. But to see them slowly cleansed by the grace of God is a marvelous thing. And that's um, and a nice, a nice section to read. And I will, I will um, highlight one of the things he says in there. One of the things you read. Um, I remind, I remind our elders. And I remind them as much to remind myself sometimes too. Is it, would be, it would be wonderful to have this neat membership list and roster that doesn't have any issues, that doesn't have any mess to it. But that's not the goal. Um, ministry, and ultimately, when I say ministry, I'm not just talking about the pastor. Um, we all have a ministry. Ministry is messy. But that's okay. Um, it was messy for Jesus, too, not because he did anything wrong, but because he was with the sinners and the outcasts, too. Any other thoughts of convicting, compelling? Joan.
Yeah, um, excellent, excellent point. Um, don't be judgmental. Gemma. Well, the, the Holy Spirit will be working whenever the gospel is being proclaimed. Um, as, as our Lord reminds us that as the, the rain and the snow fall down to the earth and never return without watering it, so it is with the word that goes out from his mouth. Um, it won't return without having accomplished the purpose for which it was sent. Um, and we pray that the Holy Spirit is... is um, given the opportunity to be able to create or sustain faith, but there are times also that that, that message convicts somebody in their unbelief too. Um, but the, the Spirit is working at any point when the gospel is being proclaimed. Well, my timer went off, so that means we've been here an hour, but I don't want to cut any conversation short. Um, if there was anything in that chapter, I should I keep calling them chapters, but they're really not chapters in there. That section that we read um, that you really wanted to highlight, um, come with that thought next week, and we can start off with that, looking at if there was anything that, that you'd like to highlight. Um, and then for next week, I'm finished the book up, um, and you'll see it covers about a, a 20 page um, section again. Not quite as many questions there at the, the end of it. And we'll work through those questions and we'll, we'll go as, as late as we, we need to go. But 7 o'clock then again next week too. 7 o'clock. Um, let's close with prayer. Almighty God, as you command angels to watch over us during the day, so may they also stand encamped about our beds this night. Forgive us, Lord, all the evil we have done this day. Hear the prayers of the Holy Spirit on our behalf. Give ear to the intercession of our Advocate and Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep us safe till morning when we wake refreshed to serve you with the new day you have given us. Amen.